want to talk a little bit about systemic therapies now. Um, and again, I made the mistake of calling this advanced prostate cancer. A lot of this would hold for patients uh, who may not necessarily be advanced or who are advanced only on PSMA, PET, et cetera. So I will remind you of an earlier slide uh, that I showed you that whether you have this acquired resistance that we talked about or the innate resistance and the mechanisms that whether you use intermittent therapy or treatment one plus treatment two or whatever, eventually you get to this point where every cell or the majority of the cells are resistant to androgen deprivation therapy. And I pointed out that there's a whole slew of treatment twos, so-called treatment twos, where treatment one is ADT, um, that have activity. And Rahul alluded to radium. We've talked a little bit about Provenge. So we're, we're going to walk through um, some of these, not all of them. And we're going to do it to just give you a sense of how we approach this and where novel therapeutics fit in. Um, we each do this in a slightly different way, but I, I think it's useful to think of um, uh, therapies not just as listing all the therapies, but to think of it by categories, by types of drugs, uh, in part because there is something that we call non-cross resistance. So just because you're resistant to one category doesn't mean you're resistant to another. Um, and it also gives us a sense of sequencing. So the quote unquote hormonal agents we've talked about a little bit, I mentioned earlier today, uh, that address that adrenal uh, contribution of testosterone. So abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, daralutamide most recently, these are all birds of a feather. They're very similar drugs. And provided the cancer continues to be dependent on very small amounts of testosterone, as we talked about this morning, uh, they're very useful agents. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about sequencing. Uh, immunotherapy, you heard uh, you know, a wonderful talk from David O this morning. Uh, we're early on in, in immunotherapy for prostate cancer, and really, again, we'll show it to you, the CYP-T, the Provenge, and Pembrolizumab. Uh, with regards to chemotherapy, I always tell patients that um, there's three big, depends on how ornery I'm feeling. If I'm feeling really ornery, I call them big lies. If I'm not feeling ornery, I call them misconceptions about chemotherapy. Um, so misconception number one is, uh, oh, it doesn't work in prostate cancer. And in fact, there's very few things that can be as effective in appropriately selected patients. Misconception number two is, oh, it's just going to make you sick. And that's just not true anymore. There was a time when chemotherapy made you pretty sick. Uh, but most of our patients on many of these therapies, I'm not going to say it's like getting water, but they're reasonably well tolerated. And most of these therapies, chemotherapies, in fact, in randomized clinical trials, uh, have been shown to improve quality of life, not decrease it, because it controls the cancer. And misconception number three, which I think has become the largest one, is, who, if my doctor is talking about chemotherapy, that must mean I should be, you know, don't buy snow tires, um, <laughs> that I'm getting near the end, of the end of the line. And that's just not true, both because chemotherapy is so effective, but also because we're using it earlier and earlier and earlier. And I already told you, showed you that we're using it, you know, treatment one plus treatment two, early on in the diagnosis of metastatic disease. There's a clinical trial just reported at the oncology meetings of using chemotherapy and hormones um, uh, immediately uh, following radical prostatectomy. Um, and, or pre-prostatectomy, pre and, and, and it has dramatic impact. Uh, on controlling the cancer. So just because your doc mentions the big C, H word, does not mean that you know, it's, it's the end of the road by any means. Uh, Rahul alluded to radiopharmaceuticals and radium. We'll talk about PSMA lutetium briefly. Um, and then at the very end, Rahul will, will talk a little bit about this is more futuristic, but how we are today using genomic targeted therapy. Earlier this morning, Dr. Feng talked to you about germline and somatic mutations and uh, genomics, and, and we'll show you how that is here today now and clearly is the future. Um, so we thought we'd do this uh, partly with a, a, a briefcase um, and then discussion of, of examples of the therapy. So this is a man who presented with a PSA of 25, 
obstructed voiding symptoms, a biopsy would show the four plus five prostate cancer, and uh, this is a PSMA PET, which picks up a bunch of uh, lymph nodes and, and a couple scattered bone metastases. And, and, and I should say that uh, PSMA PET is not standard of care anywhere, but especially in this setting with de novo case. Although this man you know, had localized disease, um, he was at high risk with a high Gleason score. Our surgeons certainly were evaluating him for a radical prostatectomy, and he may yet need definitive therapy to the prostate, but this is where one of those examples that we talked about where um, uh, it was sort of there, just not immediately visible until you did a PSMA PET. So hopefully you remember this. I showed this to you earlier today of the co-targeting, um, treatment one plus treatment two, where the, and, and this is, by the way, this case is, is in, in learning theory, you're supposed to bring everything together, right? So here you should be thinking, oh yeah, Agarwal taught us about Kaplan-Meier curves. So you know how to look at this Kaplan-Meier curve and you know about hazard ratios. So um, the yellow line is the overall survival of newly diagnosed men with metastatic prostate cancer who get treated with ADT plus abiraterone, treatment one plus treatment two. The white line, is ADT plus placebo. From Rahul's talk, you will recall that <coughs> there needs to be equipoise in the study. And when this study was done, we knew that the standard of care was ADT. So we felt okay about people who round up on that, on that arm. Now we know that moving forward, we need to add abiraterone to those patients. And what you can see is if you look at the average survival, the dotted white line, uh, with abiraterone, I showed this to you earlier, it's 53 months on average. Uh, and that's much higher than the average, the median, for those who didn't get abiraterone, 36 months. So that's all the FDA needed to approve the drug. Uh, what we're interested in, as we discussed earlier, is hazard ratio. The hazard ratio is 66. That means there is a 44% uh, risk reduction of death, the area under the curve. It's pretty good. 44% risk, percent risk reduction of death is a good thing, and so this patient, in fact, per these data, ended up being treated with abiraterone. That's all good and well. The question is, and this is what happened, to, um, his PSA fell dramatically and it stayed low for a long, long period of time. I believe this is your patient, Rahul. Um, Rahul put this slide in. Uh, to, to just show some images, different types of imaging. This is hyperpolarized carbon-13, which lets us look at the metabolic activity inside of the prostate. And the dark, the brighter the red, the more metabolically active it is. Um, and what you can see here is that after treatment, it's just dead. There's no cancer there at all. So that's good. That's what we want to see. This is not standard of care imaging. It's investigational. But you can imagine that this might be a really useful way to show that you really are killing cancer if you can't see metabolic activity there at all. So back to our case. He had a good response for many years on Lupron plus abiraterone, but now his PSA starts to go up. And eventually, his scans show new bone metastases. Um, I, will, I will point out, those people in the audience who've seen one of us will have heard the same thing, which is that a climbing PSA for us is not an indication to change therapy. A cha climbing PSA for us is an indication to get scans to see if there's been a change because there's pretty compelling data that if you keep people on abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide, the longer you keep them on, the better they do. And so waiting until there's actually changes on scans is beneficial over just reacting to PSA. So that's what we did. And so the question then is, well, what are the treatment options? Um, so this addresses this. You know, there's this growing group of patients who develop growth of their cancers following a treatment number two. And we've shown you, I hope, compelling evidence that bringing treatment one up early, or treatment two up early, is a good thing. But then that puts the onus on us to develop treatment three. And that's what we're going to talk to you about. Um, because resistance still happens, as we talked about this morning. And the exact same process that we used of adaptive resistance that we discussed this morning with ADT happens with the next treatment that you use. 
Um, the other, I already alluded to this, but these patients may or may not have uh, untreated primary tumor. Their prostate is still in place. And as you've heard, uh, that should not be forgotten since there's emerging data that suggests that in men who don't have very extensive metastases, that radiation to the prostate is, is prolongs life. Someone at lunch asked me, well, what about if you're already moved on to Zytiga, Abiraterone, um, but I haven't had my prostate treated, should I? Um, the honest answer is the data is not there. That's not where it's been tested. It's only been tested in men who are starting hormones, which was the stampede study that Dr. Roach alluded to. Um, but in all likelihood, it makes a difference in this setting too because we want to avoid that shower of subsequent metastases. In a young man where we hope to control his disease for a long period of time uh, and where there's risk of local symptomatology, we typically will recommend therapy if there isn't extensive um, uh, metastatic disease. We discussed earlier in, in the panel um, whether that would be a radical prostatectomy or radiation. Most of the data that we have is, is with radiation, but it's not ruled out. So these are the treatment options immediately available for this patient. So we can switch to an alternative hormone. I told you that we think about those classes. Um, the mileage that you get from that is not a lot, but it's some, and it's, it's doable. Uh, I'm going to talk about Cipulus LT in just a sec, Provenge. Radium, Rahul addressed, um, has some activity, um, and then conceivably taxane chemotherapy. So the first three in general, and we start individualizing, uh, if the disease is not exploding, we can do one of the first three fairly easily. So let me briefly talk about uh, Provenge. Um, um, it's important both because it's the only FDA approved uh, thera immunotherapy specifically for prostate cancer and because it was developed at UCSF. <laughs> um, so CYP-T, as, as uh, um, David O spelled out to you, um, takes the patient's own blood cells, removes them, and in the test tube activates them. Um, takes these, these dendritic cells and basically force feeds them this antigen so that they now know how to recognize prostate cancer and then you reinfuse them back into the patient. And those infusions are three, once every two weeks times three, and you're done. Um, so these are the original data, and the upper far left was, these are all, you know, I just want to point out, by the way, that we started this back in 2000 or earlier, uh, and what this graphic shows is that there are, in fact, some shrinkage of lymph nodes, and the PSA can fall. It doesn't always. So this is, uh, again, to tie in with Dr. Agarwal's talk, this was the early phase one studies when this drug first went into humans. We had very good reasons to believe that it worked uh, from preclinical models, um, and sure enough, we saw a couple patients where it worked. We came up with the right dose. We then did um, a phase two that went into a phase three, um, small numbers of patients, but again, there was in yellow, uh, Provenge and, and pink no Provenge and a survival advantage. And then that went into a big phase three study, relatively big phase three study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, all of which culminated in FDA approval um, in 2010. So it was a 10 year process. Um, one of the take home lessons, we got to speed the, this process up dramatically. This is particularly slow. Um, but it remains an important uh, armament uh, tool in our, in our chest. Uh, it doesn't drop PSAs a lot, but it does incite an immune response that lasts for years and years and years. So it's a useful thing to do. I want to, um, I think Tom is not here. Tom, Tom Hope, no, had to leave. Um, but I want to introduce the concept of theranostics. Um, which is, you'll be hearing more and more about, and Rahul will, if we have time, will speak to another agent that we've developed here at UCSF. But theranostics is, it's a little clunky word, uh, that implies the combination of a, a compound that is used both for therapy, the thera, and diagnostics. And the idea is if you can image something and show that it's there, and then use the same compound to treat it, how sweet it is. 
And so this is a good example. And PSMA, PSMA lutetium is just such a approach. We've already showed you that PSMA works. And the reason PSMA works is that there is this molecule at one end of which uh, this molecule binds to the target, the PSMA, and identifies it. The other end, you can link it either to gallium, so you can image it just the way you would do a bone scan, and that's what the PET scans look like, or you can add a smart bomb, a, war, a warhead on it. And in this case, the warhead is a highly radioactive material called lutetium. And so using the same agent, you can image and treat. And what's useful about it is it gets us away from um, throwing a therapy and hoping it hits the, the target. This ensures it's hitting the target. And here's an example. So here's a patient, uh, this slide is courtesy of Tom, here's a patient who had a very floridly positive scan. Every time you see something white, uh, there's cancer. Uh, I would ignore sort of the, the liver, spleen, bowel, these are the uh, salivary glands, those are normal. But all these other white dots in the bone, that's cancer. After this patient is imaged, he then was treated with lutetium bound to the same molecule. And here's a time course of what that looks like if you're taking pictures. So it's pretty impressive. So this is a beautiful example of Theranostics. So there's some caveats which I'll tell you about. Uh, first of all, it doesn't work in all patients. The cancer has to express PSMA. If it doesn't express PSMA, you're wasting your time. So that's the first step. The second step is that even within an individual, we and others have learned, as again just reported at the oncology meetings, that um, one cancer deposit may be PSMA avid and the one right next to it may not. So there's some, you know, you would be partially treating a patient I'm um, seeing a patient now who's got bone scan that is very PSMA avid and liver metastases that aren't. And so the tough decision is do we go ahead and treat the bone and come back to the liver or just forget the PSMA lutetium and move to something else. Um, we didn't really talk to you guys about this before but it's worth knowing in advanced disease uh, something that's called a waterfall plot. It's called the waterfall plot for obvious reasons. It looks like one. And the way these plots work is each column is one patient. So there's, you know, 100 patients here or whatever. Um, and um, what it shows you is the best PSMA, PSA response for that one patient. And if the best PSA is that the PSA climbs, Here's a patient that has a 100% increase. If the PSA declines, the best response, it'll be below this white line. We select the 50% mark, the dotted blue line. It's somewhat arbitrary, but there's good evidence that that correlates quite well with longer term outcomes like survival. And so when we look at these PSMA plots, there's two things that we, or these waterfall plots, there's two things we wanna see. One is, what is the percentage of patients that are uh, have a PSA decline that is less than, uh, sorry, more than 50% decline, because those are the patients that are really gonna benefit the most. And you can see here that's about a third of patients that are gonna have a really, really good outcome. I guess it's 40%. Um, and this is after one cycle. Uh, after two cycles, two things to point out. First of all, uh, it's only 61 patients as opposed to 99, and that's, either because the patients haven't gotten there yet in their treatment sch schema, or they've fallen out for other reasons, like side effects. So you have to be cautious about how you look at this. But nevertheless, after two cycles, after two treatments, um, it looks like about half of the patients have a decent PSA response. So while promising, uh, PSMA-targeted therapy doesn't work in all patients. Not all patients express PSMA on their surface. And, <clears throat> What's turning out to be a big issue for us is durability, because we don't know how, long, how durable this is gonna be. But it's very promising. So Theranostics should be on your radar screen. And then finally, we're gonna turn to um, having gone through sort of these, I guess the PSMA lutetium isn't quite conventional, but it's getting, it'll be there soon, it, I, we anticipate. It's, gonna, it's going through clinical trials. We actually have two or three studies open that utilize um, PSMA lutetium. 
So moving from there, we want to move now more towards integrating the information you learned this morning from Dr. Feng about genomics and how we use that to inform our decision-making process. Thanks, Eric. And so this will follow on to Felix's talk from this morning. He really nicely summarized genetic testing in prostate cancer. So we get this really nice data for, from patients, and what do we do with it? How can we target that therapeutically? This is still a very new area in prostate cancer. Um, we actually, even to date, have only one therapy, pembrolizumab, approved for the hypermutated prostate cancer. Everything else is still investigational, but I'd say that's gonna change and probably change sooner rather than later. And so hopefully we'll find ways to further get different slices of that pie. If you kind of look at metastatic, hormone-resistant prostate cancer, we, not, we know it's not one disease, and so how do we segregate patients and then apply more individualized treatment for patients? That's, that's why we do this genetic testing, but we need better targets and better medicines, and so that's really what we spend a lot of our time working on. So this is just a, a program that we've had that Eric uh, started here at UCSF. It's actually a multi-institutional multi collaboration called the Stand Up to Cancer sort of West Coast Dream Team that the funders came up with, not ourselves, as Eric likes to say. Uh, but Eric led this along with Owen Witte down at UCLA, and this was really across all West Coast institutions, Vancouver on down to UCLA, and then UC Santa Cruz was our bioinformatics computational group. And the, the great thing about this study is it allows us to really start to get at this question of the genetics of metastatic hormone-resistant prostate cancer. You know, I told you that most of the time this cancer goes to the bone, and previously this was a real technical challenge. How do you get tumor samples out of bone metastases and have enough material to actually do genetic testing and understand what's going on at a biologic level? It's actually not trivial. It took a lot of learning and training, working with the interventional radiologists that do these CT-guided needle biopsies. We got to the point where we actually now can do these biopsies in pretty standard fashion, and we have a follow-on protocol where we essentially, for patients that come to UCSF, uh, who have various criteria, including considering for clinical trial, we will, whenever feasible, try to do a metastatic tumor biopsy before patients enroll. One, from a patient perspective, we get the genetic testing of the tumor done, and we think that definitely impacts treatment. And then two, on the research side, we're able to sort of understand the RNA and the DNA and try to understand what are the predictors of response or resistance. And then we follow patients over time. So every three months, we'll assess them, get a sense of what their PSA is, what scans are showing. And then an amazing high percentage of patients actually agree to get a second biopsy at a future time point so that we can compare to the first biopsy, understand what changed over time, what caused resistance to develop to that particular therapy. And that's an enormously powerful uh, database to have for us to understand how better to develop therapies and combinations to benefit our patients. And so it's been a really wonderful to be a part of that. I, I focus a lot on the clinical annotation, the clinical follow-up from this data set, and Felix and Eric and others, a huge group of lab-based lab -based folks focus more on the, the scientific efforts to understand the genomics of these cancers. And so if you look at where we get these biopsies from, over half are from the bones. So 52%, this is a little bit dated, but at the time we did this analysis, you can see, you know, across all institutions, 387 metastatic tumor biopsies, all from patients with metastatic hormone-resistant prostate cancer, over half of which are from the bone, and then other sites, including the liver, lymph nodes, other soft tissue, um, really rich data, data base for us to be able to analyze and understand um, what are the drivers of outcomes in the setting. So I think Felix covered this really well. I would say just from a medical oncologist perspective, Eric had said this earlier too, germline hereditary testing, any patient who comes to my clinic with metastatic prostate cancer, I'll recommend germline testing. Uh, one thing that I don't think was said earlier in the morning session, a test like 23andMe and some of the other commercial tests are not sufficient for a patient with prostate cancer who's being screened for hereditary mutations. It doesn't cover the necessary panel of genes that we're interested in. There's more beyond BRCA1 and BRCA2 that we need to be able to test for, and it's only when you have that aggregate information that you really can inform a patient about not only family risk, but treatment that might be relevant for themselves, you know, themselves. Um, the platforms are less important, but I would say that we use a lot of direct-to-consumer testing. Color is a company we work with a lot. Just because it's easy, we give the kits. It can be mailed out to patients. It's a cheek swab. You mail it in. 
uh, our genetic counselors, which I will refer patients if they have a strong family history. They do testing with a blood test through Invitae. Um, these, both of these platforms are good. It covers the necessary genes that we would be wanting to test for in prostate cancer. And then the somatic, the tumor-based DNA testing, we really try to test all patients with metastatic hormone-resistant disease. If we can get a biopsy, great. There are liquid biopsies, so-called circulating tumor DNA tests. I'd say the technology is still evolving. There's a lot of variability in the quality from one test to another. However, if I have no other means of getting that information, then we do think that that test could serve of purpose. So the DNA repair abnormalities, um, you know, I think Felix covered this process in terms of the biology. Essentially, these tumors that have mutations in BRCA, they're more sensitive to medicines that damage the DNA within the cancer. You know, that's the crux of what we call the synthetic lethality of when you have this mutation, can you target it? And you look at prostate cancer and the DNA repair mutations, is not meant to be read, but just to say that this is probably about 15 to 20 percent of all metastatic hormone-resistant prostate cancer has a mutation, either in the tumor itself or in the tumor plus inherited DNA. And so it's a really valuable uh, piece of information and really a targetable subset of prostate cancer. So then how do we target it? Uh, this is still a work in progress, and we still don't have a medicine approved yet, FDA approved for treatment of DNA repair mutated prostate cancer, but I think that's going to change. Um, this is uh, the waterfall plot that Eric uh, just went through where instead of looking at PSA, this is looking at actual tumor shrinkage or tumor increase in size from baseline. So any patient who had tumor shrinkage is gonna be represented on the right side below this line, and patients where the treatment did not work are here. The medicine that these patients got was a med class of medicines called PARP inhibitors, and this particular one was called Rucaparib. There's a few different ones within this class of medicines. They have slightly different effects, but by and large, they generally are active only when there's a mutation present in a gene like BRCA. We don't think that they have a lot of single agent activity broadly in all comers. But the thing that I think is really interesting is that even within this DNA repair population, not all mutations behave the same way. And so the different colors represent mutations in different genes within this pathway. And in red are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And you can see here, don't need to run any statistics, just visually looking at this, well, actually majority of patients where either the tumor or the inherited DNA has a BRCA mutation, they can respond quite well to a PARP inhibitor. Whereas other mutations, in particular, I'll highlight a gene called ATM, we group in the same family in blue, but actually you can visually see that most of the tumors don't respond. And so our first generation precision medicine, if you will, lumping all these mutations into one bucket and then treating them the same way, clearly that needs refinement and we need to understand even within a category, the subcategories and who's gonna respond and who's not. So there's a lot of work to be done. Another class of, uh, a small subset, but an important one is what we call hypermutated prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, as it compares to other types of cancers, actually has a much lower frequency of mutations. If you just kind of look at the overall mutational burden within a prostate cancer, as compared to a melanoma or a smoking-related cancer like lung cancer, has much lower frequency of mutations. However, there's about two to three percent of prostate cancers that are hypermutated, and there's lots of mutations within the cancer. Why that matters? Because the more mutations, the more new proteins that cancer makes, what we call neoantigens, and that feeds to David's talk earlier. This is the class of uh, treatment where we think that single agent immune therapy with medicines like Keytruda, uh, Pembrolizumab, Nivolumab have a lot of activity. And the response rate is probably 50 or 60 percent of, of patients will respond. Uh, this is just data coming out of Sloan Kettering, looking at the prevalence of these mutations. It's a pretty small frequency, so this gives you the mutation frequency, uh, mutational load per sample, and it's only this segment here, about 3% of all prostate cancers have a really high rate of mutations. And when you treat these patients with an immune therapy, a checkpoint inhibitor, you get durable responses. This is what's called a swimmer's plot, so every patient is a row. From when they start treatment, the bar goes out time-wise, how long are they on treatment? And you can see that it's mixed, but there were some patients who had very durable responses. This on the bottom is weeks. So this is 80 weeks, 90 weeks. This is getting out two years plus with an ongoing response. So you can see very dramatic and durable responses in this subset of prostate cancer. 
This is actually a patient of mine who had presented uh, about two years ago now with a very large prostatic mass, uh, limited met metastatic disease, but obviously a very large mass that was causing urine obstruction and, and actually bowel obstruction, very high-grade prostate cancer. Uh, we tried to treat with chemotherapy, had some benefit, but the cancer was starting to grow. Um, you know, we did radiation and then actually a second round of radiation treatment had some benefit, but, but again, the, the tumor was, was growing and we were sort of in a tough spot. Uh, for various logistical reasons, we couldn't get a biopsy, but I did send a blood test for this circulating tumor DNA, and lo and behold, this tumor fell in this hypermutated category of prostate cancer, what we call microsatellite high, or MSI high is the short, short name for it. And you can see that when you have this, you see tons of mutations. This was the foundation panel, but the panel itself doesn't matter. What, what matters is just the number of mutations and the overall mutational burden. Well, we put this patient on pembrolizumab, got a second course of radiation as well. As compared to the previous figure I show you, you see a significant shrinkage in size of this tumor uh, and significant symptomatic relief. And so it can be really gratifying. I think the part that we're still struggling with is how do we take something where it's two to three percent and these patients have dramatic benefit how do we extend that benefit to larger percentages of patients? And are there different combinations and things we can think about doing? And so the Stand Up to Cancer program is very patient-centric. We sort of take these biopsies, we try to learn as much as we can, but we return that information to the patient. And as I said, a lot of our clinical trials utilize these biopsies as part of the infrastructure. So we really think it's an important program and it really has been uh, hopefully beneficial for patients and certainly on the research side it has. One of the things that Eric's developing um, that perhaps he can speak to more uh, detail uh, if there's questions, but we're really trying to leverage the strength of California as it pertains to just the sheer number of prostate cancer patients that are treated within the UC system and some of the regulatory infrastructure advantage that we have there in terms of shared institutional review boards. Can we open a statewide sort of basket, what we th talk about a basket clinical trial? What does that mean? Well, you take all patients with prostate cancer, you do biopsies, you get the genetic testing report, you hopefully find something that's targetable, and then you subdivide patients into the different groups, and then you treat them in a selective way. So rather than one trial, one medicine, each group of patients gets a different treatment directed towards what do the genetics of the cancer show. So uh, I will just say that pick 3 ca this is a mutation that just this last week, there's a new medicine in breast cancer for specifically breast cancers that harbor this mutation. Well, can we apply the same approach in prostate cancer? We don't have the data yet, but that's where we need to go. We talked about the PARP inhibitors, um, some of the other mutations, P53, RB1. Uh, there's probably some epigenetic alterations that may be targetable. These are sort of how genes are turned on and off. One of the things that we haven't talked too much about, but Eric and I spend a lot of time uh, research-wise and in the clinic is what's called TSCNC. This is small cell neuroendocrine prostate cancer that emerges after the androgen deprivation or hormonal therapy. And in our metastatic biopsies, we find it in about 15% of all our biopsies. Generally, these patients have a little bit more aggressive type of cancer. However, it's a, definitely an untapped area where there are novel drug targets specifically for that group of patients and we're actively developing clinical trials for that group of patients. And so, you know, this is our vision, this is Eric's vision, is really to sort of think about a basket type study. It would be tremendous to do this statewide and sort of take advantage of the, you know, really strong resources that we have because it really takes a huge infrastructure, as you might imagine, to pull off this kind of study with so many different buckets of treatments. And so with that, I'll conclude. This was Eric's last slide, so maybe you want to sort of drive home the point of what you're trying to make here. I saw this and I was trying to think about what you were going to say. Oh, come on, Rahul. So, I can guess. You know, not that long ago, it was a shotgun approach. Uh, I, we, we talked about, you know, Huggins saying, yeah, we're going to take hormones away. And it was great, but it's a shotgun. It went after all the cancers. And so we're moving into a molecular era where we characterize the patients. You could argue that we're beyond Spock, but you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, Rahul, how long have we worked together, it works, man? It works. It's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, it's a, it's a reach. Here, all right. A bit of all right. All right. So we're happy to take questions. If people want to pass questions to the aisle, we'll do that, and then Rahul will move the session on. So first question, to kind of going to one of the last things we talked about, how do you know if the tumor is neuroendocrine and how do you treat this type of prostate cancer? 
So great question. Right now, the only pure way to know it's neuroendocrine is you do a biopsy and you look at it under the microscope. Um, we have developed a genetic signature for it, but right now it's only from the tumor, so you still have to do the biopsy. Um, we're looking for circulating markers, so either the circulating tumor DNA. There are these uh, blood-borne markers that are similar to PSA. One's called chromogranin A, another's called neuron-specific enolase, blood tests. They're not great, and we're working to improve their specificity. So right now, the, the, the really amazing thing about this biopsy program is a lesson learned, and, and Rahul was, was the lead author on this paper, is we got s so much pushback and so much uh, commentary on it. I had no idea this was so common, and the answer is neither did we because no one was looking. There's all these metastases out there, and 15 to 17 percent of them are this really aggressive variant, and we really do need to know about them. So we, whenever we can, following typically abiraterone or enzalutamide, we try to do a biopsy because it's an important subset. And there's a follow-on question. Does medicines like abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide increase the risk of prostate, uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So I think the answer to that question is that we think probably yes, um, but we need more paired biopsies pre and post to really better answer that question. I think androgen deprivation in therapy in general, this is a treatment emergent effect. You don't see neuroendocrine cancer when you biopsy these patients at diagnosis. It looks like a standard adenocarcinoma. So clearly it's a treatment emergent resistance outgrowth. Whether there's differences between abiraterone and zalutamide, I think you know we need larger numbers of patients to really be able to answer that question. Um, and hopefully with our increasing sort of data set of paired biopsies, we'll be able to do that. Clearly for our subset that we have looked at that have available pairs, you will see some adenocarcinoma at baseline and neuroendocrine following the treatment of enzalutamide. This doesn't suggest that we shouldn't use these medicines because clearly they have a, a, a large benefit in patients, but it does suggest the need to be aware of this phenomenon and then hopefully we can develop better therapies for it. All right, let's see. This is a good question for you. For Eric, so at what time in a patient's treatment course should he see a medical oncologist for advice? Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're probably gonna get a little bit to that this afternoon in, in, in how best to do this. You know, we're pretty unique at an academic center like this in that we work so closely with our urologists and our radiation oncologists that we get involved very early, meaning as soon as the PSA starts to go up after definitive local therapy. Um, outside of that setting, um, without question, any time there are metastases, in my estimation. Uh, it used to be that you know anyone could use Lupron and, and Casadex, but as we start getting into the era of intensification and who do you intensify with, it requires, I think, a medical oncologist experience. And the drugs aren't without toxicity. Um, so somewhere between the time that the PSA progresses and there's overt metastases. And you could argue that, as we showed you, for many patients, when the PSA is climbing, there are already metastases. You just have to look for them with a PSMA PET. Uh, 